The Judge is the Millennium Writer's spin on the 1983 film The Star Chamber, and while it falls flat at the end, it somehow manages to be more thematically coherent than the film that inspired it. Let's get into it. At a bowling alley, a rando creep stalks one of the gluttonous patrons. After the patron is finished with his meal, the stalker follows him to the parking lot with a bowling ball and... Days later, an innocent woman receives a severed human tongue in the mail. Mantimu is really stepping up its game. There seems to be no rhyme or reason as to why the woman received the tongue. But Frank and Bob Bletcher recall a case in which severed fingers were sent to an unsuspecting person. In both cases, the rest of the body was never found. Which Frank theorizes means that the killer is taking care to dispose of the body. We're introduced to Cheryl Andrews, a forensic pathologist for the group played by the always fantastic CCH Pounder. In examining the tongue, Andrews surmises that the killer wasn't particularly careful in carving it out. Frank says this is a deviation, but he doubts that the killer is going to stop. As if on cue, we're introduced to the judge, played by Marshall Bell, and recently released convict Mike Bardale, played by John Hawks. I think we can all agree that the casting director deserved a raise based on this show's guest stars alone. Bardale thinks the judge is hitting on him at the local bar, but instead the judge just admires Bardale for being willing to take human lives as he sees fit. He offers a trade. Bardale comes to work for him, and in exchange, Bardale gets to stay out of prison. It turns out a position with the judge has just opened up because Nearman, the sweaty stalker from the cold open, didn't kill his victim in the proper fashion and may also have been drunk. The judge has Bardale execute Nearman as his first act. A break in the case comes from, of all people, Catherine. Catherine's work is counseling the woman who received the ear. It turns out that the woman's husband was sent to prison, and he was murdered in prison before his appeal on the basis that the cop perjured himself was heard. Frank is called in because they found the man with no tongue, but he's more interested in a John Doe that was brought in around the same time. Frank tells Seattle PD, much to their dismay, that the two bodies are connected. Because Frank. Of course Frank is right. The John Doe found at the rail yard had our guy's flesh underneath his fingernails from the struggle. Bletch is happy to close the case, but Frank says there's more to it. And you can just see that damn it Frank more paperwork look on Bletch's face. Indeed, there is more. As the judge lays down a sentence on another evildoer and instructs Bardale to carry out the execution. This time it's a guy who took down the lighting in his apartment building causing one of his tenants to have a fatal fall. As punishment, Bardell will cut off his leg. The judge explains that his is a court of justice, not law, making him sound like an nth degree sovereign citizen. There's a greater than zero chance that this guy would have had a YouTube channel where he went around recording traffic stops. Bardell is successful in his mission, boxing up the leg and sending in a package. The SPD attributes it to Nearman, but Frank thinks this is a different killer. When Jim Pinsiers contacts Frank to let him know that the cop who had his tongue cut out also perjured himself in the trial of the husband of the woman who received the tongue, Frank puts it all together. Someone is meeting out justice where the law has failed. Andrews finds traces of cranberry seeds, which leads to a field where they find the victim in an abandoned shaft. Frank and Bletcher search the dive bars where they run into Bardale, who panics when he sees Frank. Sure enough, he bolts, but not before his car tags lead back to the judge. The judge is actually happy to see Frank, whom he views as a kind of kindred spirit in the pursuit of natural law justice. And he's right to feel so confident, since the cops have no tangible evidence on him to speak of. Once more, it could be Carl, hired man who cared for my hogs. Drifter and an alcoholic, I never asked his last name. They have to let the judge go due to lack of direct evidence, but not before he offers Frank a job as his right hand. The rusty to his Wapner. The writers leave it open to interpretation, just how the judge knows so much about Frank, because it goes beyond just knowing information that would be available to a judge. The judge files wrongful arrest lawsuits against the cops, manipulating the legal system against them and brazenly avoiding any consequences. The SPD knows what's up, but with no proof, they can't follow up, which seems to be a part of the judge's thrill. The judge goes missing after being released, prompting Bletch to think they missed their chance with him, but Frank knows something is not right. Bardale is also missing, but Frank theorizes that Bardale won't go far, 
So he approaches the judge's home, where he finds a bloody Bardale enjoying what's left in the fridge. It turns out that Bardale didn't appreciate the judge letting himself get captured or filing nuisance lawsuits against the police. Bardale believes in the natural law of things and came to see the judge as a hypocrite who really didn't care about justice at all. Bardale turns himself in peacefully, being fully aware of his place and purpose in the world. What did he say to you? He said the judge was a pig. And we're out. I mentioned in the pilot episode and the opening to the guide that the show often tried to tackle ponderous philosophical topics, and the judge is certainly one of those episodes. Without spoiling the series, one of the major themes of the show will continue to be not whether there will be an apocalypse, but how humankind can control and direct it. To that end, Frank Black and the judge are somewhat on the same page. Both believe in the order of things, that we have the right and the ability to impose justice on the world. And in the end, the judge was killed by some random tweaker who opted out of the system. Bitch was pure pig. The episode begins with another quote from Melville, this time on the dichotomy of the visible world and the invisible world. We erect systems of linguistics, economics, and justice, and they're ubiquitous so they can feel like they're natural systems. But the true natural systems are chaotic and dangerous, and we underestimate them to our peril. This is also the first mention of the term legion. My name is Legion. Legion. Which many fans of the show have fanned into a sort of Legion of Doom to the Millennium Group Super Friends. The judge fumbles the story about Legion from the New Testament, which just makes his fate that much funnier. In the Bible, Jesus happens upon a man possessed by a group of demons that call themselves Legion. And when Jesus performs an exorcism, as an act of mercy, he doesn't send the demons to hell, but rather casts them into a drove of nearby pigs. The pigs go out of control and tumble down an embankment where they drown. Jesus was politely asked to leave the area after the incident. Here, the judge says that Jesus was actually curing the pigs, not the man which seems to be a subtle, intentional error on the part of the writers because the judge carries on with delusions of grandeur, promising that if Frank comes to work for him, he and his family will be safe because the Bardales of the world fear him. All of this points to the judge not knowing how the world really works. I have to get into some mild spoilers here, but one of the show's issues is that it wants to be seven, but every week, and it stretches credulity. Not to mention the patience of the audience, if Frank Black is just catching a religious serial killer every episode. Chris Carter wanted to be more ambitious than that. Catching Frank's struggle with the darkness inside himself and the darkness he sees in the world balanced against the yellow house, which represents light in the world. Family, love, and faith in the basic goodness of people. But that still leaves the problem of what do you do every week? So many of the episodes tease spilling over into the supernatural. Gehenna, for example, implied that the villain Ricardo Clement was demonic in nature, pure evil rather than created by social ills. To sort of goose the lore along, fans began connecting these elements of evil as if they were not isolated incidents, but part of a larger effort to corrupt mankind, sow discord, and bring about chaos. Some fans insist these forces are working together, like an organization with a hierarchy. Others think of it as an ideology that guides them, like Antifa, not centralized, but bound by a common ethos. Whatever the intent, the judge mentions Legion here, and that idea really starts to gel late in the season, so I thought I'd bring it up. Anyway, this episode is a good example of what made the show interesting in the early season. It's got a strong sense of theme, and the performances by the guest stars put it over the top is a great episode for me. John Hawks might have been typecast over his career, but he always manages to bring a quiet, simmering intelligence to his portrayal of Bumpkins. And of course, character actor Marshall Bell brings his brand of frustrated high school principal energy to every role he plays. Like Hawks, he may be stuck in one lane, but he's going full throttle. Another thing this episode has going for it is the appropriateness of the tone when measured against that of the show. That's something I can't say about the next episode.